Go ahead. Okay, so University of Idaho, determination of planetary boundary layer height. Go for it. So my name is uh, Constantine Geranius from the University of Idaho. I'm a graduate student there in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. And we are going to look at today the termination of the planetary boundary layer height in Lakeview, Oregon during the 2023 annular eclipse. Uh, my team consisted of myself, Kaylee Hodges, Logan Kearney, Shashwu Narula, Ashley Keeley, Kyron Mesenbrek, Logan Long Cole, Chase Cole, William Shaw, and Dr. Matthew Bernards. So first, what we're looking at is uh, what is the planetary boundary layer, right? There's the nocturnal planetary boundary layer, which is um, happens at night when there's not solar radiation. And it's a lower stable area that tends to have an inver a temperature inversion. And, uh, and then during the day, um, it is a higher and it's a mixing zone of, of the surface heating and the radiation heating. And so this layer of mixing above the surface, which is where we live, and uh, why this is important, right, is because in the middle of the day, uh, in a normal day, this happens, um, you know, at, not, at happens when it becomes night and happens in the morning, right, the shift. But during an eclipse, we're seeing a rapid shift to this in the middle of the day. And what are the effects of that, right? And uh, this area also has a lot of uh, pollution in it that gets mixed and moved around. And uh, so, yeah. So how do you determine the height? Uh, this is a flight from Toltan, Chile. Um, and as you can see here, uh, they have chosen where the planetary boundary layer height is by looking at one of the skew T log P uh, graphs, right? And uh, and this is done by hand. Um, and as you can see here, you can only, it, you're reading a graph. So how accurate is your reading of a graph? And a lot of the times it's where this planetary boundary layer height is not as clear as this graph, right? Um, this is a good example of where it is because it's um, you can see pretty well on the graph. And uh, but yeah, so it's done by hand, takes a little time. And uh, and at times it can be and at times, depending on the graph, it's hard to determine an actual height. So at the University of Idaho, uh, algorithm was developed um, using three different methods. The first method is the virtual potential temperature. And so what we're looking at is the virtual temperature as it changes um, in altitude. So what we want it to do is deviate from the ground value. So where it begins to deviate from the ground value is where we determine it to um, the plant, the top of the planetary boundary layer to occur. And uh, also because this is, uh, exp you know, this is experimental data, we have smoothed our data to show not every small fluctuation. And, uh, and we did this using a spline. And so you get this graph here, which, um, and where we determined it, the planetary boundary layer to be, there's about 260 meters. And uh, because that's, it starts to deviate from a pretty set area at that point. And, uh, and so that's our method. And in the equation, you have uh, the potential temperature and uh, your mixing ratios with a uh, liquid mixing and uh, water vapor mixing. Next, we also looked at the potential temperature gradient, not just the potential temperature, but the change in potential temperature. And uh, and the potential temperature is your temperature, your standard pressure, pressure, and your Poisson's constant, which is, uh, if I recall exactly, it's your gas constant and a CP value, but it we call it Poisson's constant, it's about two sevenths. And, uh, and we're looking for the maximum gradient. This graph doesn't show it the best, but that is where the maximum gradient occurs because you're you're getting it from every data point, right? And we have a lot of data points. So our gradient is sometimes zero because there's no change between points, but our overall maximum is what we're looking for, is a maximum in the area. So you have a patch of where it's more max, where the gradient is going higher. And that is what we determine to be the planetary boundary layer uh, height using the potential temperature method. And as you can tell, it's this. these are all for the same flight. The, this graph, the previous graph, this graph, and the next graph. And they're choosing different heights. Uh, the final method we used was the bulk Richardson number. And uh, and we're looking for when it crosses, crosses a critical threshold of 0.25. It's a unitless number. And uh, your Z, U, and V are, uh, are wind vectors. And your G is your force of gravity. 
And uh, then you also have your uh, virtual potential temperature where you are and your virtual potential temperature at the ground. And, uh, and you use that and you, you put it together and where that number crosses 0.25 is where we consider the planetary boundary layer height to be for our, for our algorithm. So why are we using different methods, right? Um, so each method gives us different results. And uh, for th this, our third flight in Lakeview, Oregon, we got the results of 262 meters, 1,314 meters, and 630 meters um, in the order that the slides came up. And uh, so we looked at three um, conditions to determine which method to use, right? So the conditions we looked at were stability, saturation, and whether a nocturnal boundary layer was present. And uh, and so first we looked at stability, right? And uh, so there, we have two stability measurements in there, but we only, we use one as a check and then we use the other one to, we wanna see if they agree. But first we use the virtual potential, potential temperature gradient. So we look at the gradient. If it's negative, it's unstable. If it's positive, it's stable. And that is what we choose to determine our stability. Um, we we check it with the, uh, with the, with the, with the BV frequency and uh, to see, but we, we go with the virtual potential temperature gradient. And next we're looking at saturation, right? And uh, for this uh, campaign, we're considering the atmosphere to be saturated if our radio sounds indicate a relative humidity of 96%. That's because there's a resolution of 1% with the radio sounds and a 3% error. So anything greater than 96% we're considering saturated. And this is averaged over the first 200 or 2000 meters. So if it's averages up there, then we're considering the atmosphere saturated. Next, we're looking for if there's a nocturnal boundary layer present. And uh, and so, and this is just a cool layer of air adjacent to the ground that forms at night. And how we determine this is we're looking for a temperature inversion um, up to, I believe, 200 meters. So if it's getting warmer, the higher it goes, then we determine a nocturnal boundary layer is present. So these are our results from uh, Lakeview, Oregon. And as you can see, um, you know, as to be expected, it, you know, it's lower at night when there's a nocturnal boundary layer lower there, and then it's higher during the day. We get so, and we also get some change. Uh, we, and as you can see during the eclipse, which is in green, that is from the green section is our initial, when it uh, first contact and last contact, the red line being the totality. This was during the day, right? This was right after sunrise for us because where we were located had a mountain right where the sun was and we were right next to it. And so uh, the sun came up and then the eclipse happened soon after that. And during a normal day, you'd expect it to rise. It would The planetary boundary layer would rise during this time because it's going from a nocturnal boundary layer to a, uh, to a, uh, a, a daytime boundary layer. And uh, we saw it, but during the eclipse, we saw it kind of stay the same during that time, which is which indicates because there's not the solar as much solar heating going on or solar radiation heating the ground, that we kind of had a continuation of a nocturnal boundary layer to an extent during the eclipse, which is what we would have expected to see. And uh, and also another thing, our during our campaign, our atmosphere was unsaturated during the entire campaign uh, campaign which um, if you were there, it's not a surprise because it was very dry and windy. And, uh, and as we were also, and uh, so our results were consistent with what we expected to find. And, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the National Eclipse Ballooning Project, the Idaho Space Grant, Lakeview, Oregon High School, Daly Middle School, and the University of Idaho. And uh, the codes to, to do the analysis are at this GitHub here, and it's publicly available. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? I'm gonna steal Angela's question Hello. from an earlier speaker. How different will it be during a total eclipse compared to an annular eclipse? Um, I would hope to see a, um, a, a possible drop even more during the actual eclipse event, but um, I don't know that that'll happen, but 
with less solar radiation it could happen. But during this uh, campaign in 2020, we did not see the expected results either. So the results have not been consistent throughout different campaigns. So in the chat, and, Angela uh, pointed out that the next eclipse will be at a different time of day, later in the day. Yes, yeah, so it should it should still, we're hoping to see a drop in it, yes. Yep. And where we were, we did not actually see the eclipse. It was very, it was cloudy during our time, the time of the eclipse. That's, okay. what I tell, uh, that's what other... I tell people. I, I, I worry less than some other people about seeing the eclipse because my flight will see the eclipse, but I want to see the eclipse, for sure. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you.